thank you very much. While um, they are connecting my presentation, I would like to thank a uh, few people um, who have very kindly invited me once again to St. Petersburg. It's always a pleasure and a privilege to come back to the place where uh, we started uh, laparoscopic training nearly two years ago. And it is always nice to see uh, so many uh, Russian friends now that I've made over the years. And in some ways, uh, it is really humbling to find out sometimes people travel two, three, four, or even five hours to come to the Congresses. Um, it makes me feel very humble because they travel to come and learn. So I'm grateful to that. While they're sort of setting the presentation up, uh, I have been um, asked to talk about ideal TME. Um, I, I never think that ideal TME exists because if it is ideal TME, then as a rectal cancer surgeon, you probably would stop operating. Um, Bill Heal, who everybody knows, always used to say that all his life he wanted to do the perfect TME. And he said to himself that I would retire on the day when I would have done the perfect TME. But he couldn't do it. This is his own words. And that's why he carried on doing to find the perfect solution. So I think you can aim for perfection. Ideal probably stick in your head. And you should do sort of aim for ideal at the back of the, the, back of the mind, really. So the idea really is that people would expect that I would say, Ideal TME is perhaps open, ideal TME is perhaps laparoscopic, or ideal TME is perhaps using a robot, robot or robotic TME. I personally think that it is uh, nothing to do with the technique itself, it's the concept of precision. And if we agree what the total mesorectal excision should look like, or what we call a specimen-oriented surgery, or the surgery around the specimen, then it really doesn't matter for, for a concept, whether you do it open, laparoscopic, or robot. So if you have agreed to what the, the concept should be, then you can start arguing and say uh, a better way or a perfect way of doing it is either using this technique or the other technique, because then you are getting into the question of short-term advantages to patients, and we must do what is better for patients. And then perhaps uh, something like advantages to surgeons, Nobody ever measure the comfort of surgeon. Doing a total mesorectal excision is a hard work, as you've probably seen in the last uh, two days. You know, the people who did two perfect operations yesterday, they made it look easy, but I can tell you it is hard work. I was lucky that I was using the machine, so I'm not tired. The machine is tired, perhaps. Okay, so I would start, and I would start with this, really, this, this picture or painting. Um, if any of you might know, this is a picture titled as Hand of God. And as a surgeon, I look at it and think that perhaps the God is trying to touch the hand of a surgeon, perhaps a colorectal surgeon, trying to, teach, trying to tell them that you could do a specimen-oriented surgery. But if you look at it a bit more carefully, you can almost sort of think that this is almost like a shape of a brain or a head. So as a, as a colorectal surgeon or a surgeon, I think that half of what I do with my hands come from the head. So you must be very clear in your head what you want to do before you start using your hands. The surgery is half of it in your mind and half of it is in your hand. So this picture is titled Hand of God. As you might know that there was something else many, many years ago which was also titled Hand of God, which... Uh, uh, res resulted into different results, really, but this is not what we as a perfect surgeons would like to do. We would like to hang on to the first picture rather than hand of God. Okay, so we move on, and these are the two pictures. Everybody talks about them. You might, you might know uh, one face or one name, you know, Bill Heal. I don't know how many of you know him. He's Brendan Moran. And he's the guy who worked with Bill Heal initially as his senior registrar and later on as his, as his junior consultant and in the last few years of Bill's career as um, a very good assistant, really, you know, because I had a privilege to work with both of them. Bill had retired by the time I came to Basin Stoke in 2001, but he always used to come and operate. 
And what I realized was, really, Bill, would, Bill could only do what Brendan would show him with his retractors. So exposure is everything. You know, you saw a difficult case yesterday. Professor Zarkov did it. And the difficulty was seeing it. If you can see it, then you can operate. And then you can do things. It's the exposure that is, that is a crux. And in fact, um, it was Brendan Moran who made me into a colorectal surgeon. I was interested in doing liver surgery because I thought this is much nicer and much sexier to be a liver surgeon than, than doing the bottoms. Uh, but he used to uh, tease me and say that you could never do laparoscopic TMEs because you could never get a big St. Mark's retractor. And he used to show me his hand as he's trying to pull that how much tension it needs for traction. And you could never do it laparoscopically. So I got interested in this and I ended up as a colorectal surgeon. So that is his fault really um, that I've become a colorectal surgeon. Right. So... I started off talking to you about this concept, and to me, really, the concept is not so much whether it is open laparoscopic or robot. It's about the first three things, on, or first three lines on the slide. You've got to respect the embryology. Conceptually speaking, if you look at it, we have a perfect design for a colorectal surgeon because the tissue planes really rest on each other, and all you have to do is to reverse the anatomy. You have to separate one embryological layer from other, and if you could do that circumferentially around the specimen, this is which I describe it as operating in the rim of air around the specimen, and if you could do this, and you end up with a good specimen. So that's the simple concept in my mind. I think that's very important as a, as a TME surgeon or a rectal surgeon. Minimal tissue trauma. I genuinely think that if you don't hold, or if you don't destroy the tissue and you just support tissue and you do enough traction to see, um, you are likely to get better outcomes. And that is because you would have less blood loss, you would have less tissue trauma, people would have better immunity to recover from. You mustn't do um, tumor handling. We all know that, that perhaps manipulating the tumor or putting a lot of tension over it uh, is likely to result into tumor damage. And I sort of sum it up in, in minimal access surgery, I call it, if I just use this term, because that would incorporate both laparoscopy and robotic surgery. And I always say that when I have a traction and a counter traction, in my head, I usually have about 90 seconds to do with the view that I've got. Because in 90 seconds, my hands would move and the picture would look different. So. This is how my simple mind works. When I expose something, I always do something for about 90 seconds before my hand moves in, and I look at the next pattern or the next picture. And that's the key um, in doing minimal access surgery. So in a nutshell, really, what I'm trying to say is that if you watch a, a rectal cancer surgeon do it, and it looks good, it usually works. If you ask the patient what would the patient want from a total mesorectal excision, this is what they really want. You know, they want better short-term outcome. They don't want to be in hospital with complications and major problems. They want to get out of the hospital and be in their home environment as soon as they can do it. Of course, they are interested in cure. We are interested in cure. And you want a better long-term oncological outcome, which means that you would have better long-term cure. Something that we used to forget and not take much notice of is the better quality of life. Because we really thought as a surgeon that I have cured you. You know, you can go back impotent, you may have a leg bag, you may have very bad bowel function because the joint is bad, but I have cured you. Increasingly, it is becoming obvious that giving them better quality of life is equally important than curing the cancer. So these are the three things, if you ask patient, in nutshell, they want from a rectal cancer surgeon. I always say that uh, as a surgeon, you cannot change the biology of the disease. And you have no control in poor differentiation, better <coughs> differentiation of the cancer. It is what it is. What you have control of is the, on the quality of clinical outcome. So I am always interested in people to send them home without their cancer and without complication. That's what I'm interested in when I see them. 
I have to talk about data because this is a scientific meeting. I'm I'm really sorry because you know you are one of those loyal people who have hung around on the second day of the Congress in the last hour. So I try to be quick. These are the two landmark papers as everybody would know about it. The first paper is Bill Heal's paper where he showed 4% local recurrence rate following uh, a standardized open TME technique described in 1986. And this is what caused the problem in England because everybody said that he's making his figures up and they are not true figures. Unless they had a professor from US, I think he came and spent six weeks in Basingstoke trying to watch him operate politely, but effectively he went through his data to make sure that this is verified data. The second paper is much more of interest to me because I'm interested in teaching and training. The second paper showed that if you can teach in a standardized way, people are able to reproduce the same results. And that's what the guys uh, at Stobian Home Unit, I think, who, who sort of did this and, and look at this, and Brendan Moran was on this with Bill, and they showed that the local recurrence rate in, in Nordics or Scandinavian countries also came down to similar figures as Basingstoke. So it is possible, there is no magic in this really. It is possible for people to do it. Then came laparoscopic surgery in 1991-92, and it changed the word of laparoscopy. I have been involved uh, in doing laparoscopic colorectal surgery from 1999-98. I came from South Africa to work in England with somebody who was doing laparoscopic colorectal surgery. His name was Robin Kennedy, and uh, I am ever so grateful to him uh, for, for making me interested in something that became the norm. But I can tell you that in 1999, it used to take him about seven hours to do a simple laparoscopic sigmoid colectomy because everybody was learning. And we were one of the centers participating in classic trial. So we were seen as experts. So that's why when people talk about results of classic trial, I know what the reality was and what the trial showed. It does have some limitations. Um, 2D image I put down there, but actually now you can do 3D laparoscopy. So that is no more a handicap. It does have a fulcrum effect because your fulcrum is the interior abdominal wall where the port moves. All your instrument, if you're doing a pelvic dissection, they come perpendicular to the rectal plane. So the hook or a harmonic come perpendicular to where you're working. So you're always at the right angle to your plane particularly a male patient and the pelvic side wall is more challenging to do if you think about it laparoscopically. Um, if you drink too much coffee or vodka for that matter before you start the operation, you can see your tremors quite significantly. So today with a robot, at least you can hide your tremors. And it did have a steep learning curve. You know, you need to do X number of cases before the outcome starts getting better. What are the challenges? I, in fact, I could take away a laparoscopic TME. I could just say, what are the challenges of TME surgery, full stop. And if you look at the list, really, all of this is applicable to either open or laparoscopic. Difficult access, male patients, exposure, retraction of tissue in the correct plane, what energy source we use? You know, some people say, I always do it with monopolar diathermy because this is the best way. Some people say, no, it's the harmonic which is the best way. Other people say ligature. So there are different energy sources that you can use. I personally think the best is what works in your hand and what gives your patient better outcome. So you become good at something and then become really good at something before you have an opinion. So that's what I would suggest to you, whatever you use, Use it in a way that it is uh, applicable to your patients. Male patients are difficult. In laparoscopy, for a long period of time, I used to hear this as a trainee in England. You know, they have a problem with stapling, particularly the rectum. I have five, six staple line, and that's why we have a bigger leak rate. It's very difficult to get below. I genuinely think that if you don't try to reinvent the operation, most of these things can overcome, you can overcome most of these difficulties. I would never say that it become easy. Difficult operation is difficult, no matter which way you do it. So 
the problem people used to make for a rectal staple division was that A, they were never going low enough from the top, and they would never have the last tube circumferentially free of the pelvic floor for the staple to go down. So they would end up doing an oblique staple line with four or five staple crossing before they would have problems. So, but actually most of the laparoscopic surgeons have figured that out now and they don't see that as a problem. I put peer, peer pressure, or which, is, uh, which became a problem in England for that matter because if you're not doing laparoscopic TME surgery, you know, you're not good enough surgeon really. You know, in every meeting they used to ask each other, do you do lap TMEs? And he say, oh, I'm learning. So you're not good enough, really. So people feel more pressure to do it because they have to tell their group that, you know, I'm doing it. No matter how you do it, but you have to come up with some time of sort of title, so to speak. Classic trial made a lot of problem for us in England because it showed that we had high conversion rate and we have high margin positive. The CRM margins were positive. And that's why our society discouraged colorectal surgeon using laparoscopy for rectal cancer surgery. I'm, I'm just going to rush through some of these slides because uh, I know I'm standing between you and your uh, taxis and Danilo Miskovic's presentation who's perhaps preparing still. Uh, I'll talk to you about this meta-analysis. This is a meta-analysis uh, published recently which look at laparoscopic and open rectal dissection. And effectively what it shows is what we all know without much of a science, that laparoscopy benefit with shorter hospital stay, early return to bowel function, reduced blood loss, number of transfusions, and post-op bleeding. Now, these are short-term outcomes, and we know that, that people have better short-term outcomes if you have minimal access approach. It is <laughs> at par with our open surgery, which means it is oncologically safe, but have better short-term outcome. This is um, a paper from Mario Mourinho's uh, unit. Um, if you know M Professor or Dr. Mourinho, who is um, current president of EAES, and they looked at um, another systematic review, and they looked at long-term or short-term mortality and morbidity associated with lap and open. And what they concluded in that paper was that whatever had been published so far, they look at about 1,700 patient that morbidity and mortality in a subgroup analysis suggests that laparoscopy have better morbidity and mortality when you compare to laparoscopy and open. I'm going to rush through this paper. This is color two trial. You know, this has been uh, quoted, I think Professor um, Zarkov uh, quoted this, some of these figures in his talk on the first day. But really, this was uh, a second phase to color one, where they looked at rectal cancer. This is a European study, uh, run over six years, 30 centers, eight different countries. They looked at only rectal cancer, about 1,000 patients. Um, I must um, add to this that I'm grateful to Nunu for providing these slides to me. He's beginning to see his slides being used by different surgeons, so I'm grateful to him. They compared lap and open group, and they looked at the surgeon as well as the quality of specimen as well. So they were, they were basically grading both surgeons and the specimen. It looks very busy slide, really, but what I'm trying to show you with this color two study is that nearly 60, 30 to 34%, nearly sort of 70 or 66% or, or, or of the patient have what we call no sphincter preservation. So either they had an AP or Hartman's not being joined together. So it's quite a high proportion of people not to give them the joint really. And it's not that it's only in laparoscopic arm, it's for both arms. If you look at this, abdominal perineal resections, 29% in lap group, 23%, which some of us would say that this is slightly higher than, than normal. Our unit figure for AP is around 12%, 12-13%. Um, obviously, it takes slightly longer in lap group, which is not surprising as compared to open. So I'm just going to rush through this because you all know this. You have probably read this paper that it says uh, people have quicker return to bowel function uh, in laparoscopic arm, but that's, that's neither here nor there, really. You know, this is not what makes the big difference. I'm just going to come to 
uh, morbidity, again, 40% in lap group and 37% in open group. Very similar, both harms. So quite high in astromotic leak rate, 13% versus 10%. Um, again, the thing that I want to sort of look at perhaps is this, this slide, which would show complete mesorectal excision in lap and open group, almost similar. Positive CRM, 10% in both arms. So this is, this is, remember, data submitted by expert centers in Europe. So they are pretty well trained in doing lap and open TMEs, but still 10% CRM positivity in an RCT is significantly higher. Most good units, if you go to, uh, would tell you that they have single figure CRM. So something in the area of five to 6% is seen as normal. I'm just gonna go through this. This has been uh, discussed. The Korean trial have been discussed already, so I'm not gonna sort of waste time here. But just gonna show you this. This is a Korean study which basically looked at mid to low rectal cancer, a lap versus open. This is quite a good study. It looked at disease-free survival. This is three-year data, so they need a long-term data still. But it shows that they have um, equivalent disease-free survival and equivalent overall survival. So this is um, the recommendation of the paper uh, that laparoscopic resection is feasible even after locally advanced tumor. Uh, but this is a three-year data and they're interested in long-term outcomes. So what about robotics? So I've talked about open, I've talked about laparoscopy, uh, I've shown you a robotic surgery, so I must talk about robotics as well. It has gained more popularity in recent years, and this is an older figure. Th there are more than 1,000 robot systems in U.S. now, and Korea is the country which has got the largest number outside U.S. In England, I think we have 42 systems already. But whatever was published and driven, it was really driven by a urology practice. It came to the urologist in the first instance who pushed the robotic surgery. It does have limitation in multiple quadrant surgery because you have to dock and undock each time you go in a different quadrant. So that's why it suited very well to the urologist because they can just dock between the legs and work on single organ facing in one direction. But really, the question a laparoscopic surgeon often asks me is that what is there that the experienced laparoscopic surgeon can't do, which the robot do? Some might um, think that having a robotic surgery or having a robot doing a TME is just the translation of hand of God again. You know, perhaps this is the hand that we want rather than the God's hand touching us because this would take us through. Lots of us think that doing robotic surgery is great fun. You know, you can really enjoy operating and everything looks very good, as perhaps this cartoon woman suggests that this looks like a good fun. I'm just trying to sort of see if it plays. I'm just going to show you very short clips. I know you have seen the surgery. You don't need to see it very often. If it, I hope it works. No, it doesn't. Maybe somebody need to sort of play it at the bottom end. This is a female patient. Um, this is a, a 3D view for me, sat out there. If you bring the lights down, perhaps it's easier. Can somebody just uh, bring the lights? Притушите, пожалуйста, свет. Actually, this this is if if Jim starts again, perhaps uh, I give you an idea. Okay, so let it run. That's okay. So if they can dim the lights a bit, it would be easier. So start it again, perhaps. Are they going to dim it? No? Ребята, можно свет? Возможно, притушить свет или нет? Okay. So if you look here. This is the angel's hair or, or the TME plane. Everybody goes through the air. That's the mistake we often make. It really is where the air join the yellow. That's where the plane is. And if you have enough traction to see the next image, watch the wrist turning back on itself. This is the right nerve, left nerve being pulled up here. It's an operation between the two nerves, really. And your hand, the robotic hand, or the distance, or the difference between the robotic hand and the laparoscopy is the angle where you're working on. You are really working in anteroposterior angle, so almost working in a U around the specimen. In laparoscopy, you come from the side. It doesn't mean that you can't do it laparoscopically. Of course you can. You saw a fantastic 
demonstration done yesterday by Alexei Karushan. But you can see it's very easy to follow this air here and cut this nerve or go too far back and make these pre-sacral veins bleed. It is quite easy to do that, you know, and you need to sort of think just like a specimen really. So this is female. They are always uh, very photogenic, both inside and outside. Um, this is a, a, a male patient. I just give you an example to just give you, show you the applicability. And the idea really is to show you that all the techniques should look exactly the same. All your operations should look exactly the same, boringly same, really. I often joke with my assistant that in your operating theater where you do prior, your elective practice, you must have a very boring life. If you're looking for excitement, try having a second wife or having an affair. That would give a lot of excitement. You don't want that in theater. So really, it's there where you have to be. Nice, tight pelvis, two nerves on each side. And we are going along really just painting the top end of the air. So you go a long way back first, as you saw. And if you notice how the wrist of this instrument move, literally like a snake going right and left, you know, between the nerves. So you stay between the nerves as you progress. Then I mark it on the side here anteriorly. Just mark the peritoneal reflection. And yes, there was a comment made in the operation today that perhaps I don't have much traction. I often say you don't need that much traction because you compensate with a fantastic 3D view. Right nerve here, just staying inside and just painting it, really. It's a gift that you have as a surgeon that you have been allowed to live in the time where you have a precision surgery. You know, we could have all been alive 60, 70 years ago doing open complex surgeries. This is the best time to be alive, in my view. You progress here anteriorly, you mark this, mark it on the left side, just the peritoneal marking really, to keep your bearing right. Then at this stage, I would come right back and release the left nerve. Very easy to stay outside, stay inside, drop the left nerve. And if you notice that what I'm trying to do, even in a tight, narrow pelvis and obese patient, is chase the air. Air is the clue in this operation. If you can do the operation in the rim of air around the patient, then you've done a pretty good job. You all the way down now, coming to the postro lateral side. The clue to this operation is at the back. You have to go a long way posterior first to give you an idea of where your U has to come from the side. And people often make that mistake that they don't do enough posteriorly and then they get lost. So do a long way back first before you start coming around, almost like in a half U. So, so again, nerve being pulled up, air being shown, then I'm just going to come back and do it anteriorly now. Seminal vesicle coming up, denovelius fascia, you just keep painting it. And if you notice, I try not to hold thing. I try just to use the weight of the arm for attraction and counter-traction. Again, just there, just there where the air is. And this is, again, a common place. If there is no anterior tumor, you can go through this fascia, try to save your nerve plexus, because that's the place where we damage it more often without knowing it. We are always looking for nerves at the aorta and at the start, but actually this is the place where you damage it more often. Then I put uh, a, a straight proline stitch, uh, just like a standard laparoscopy that uh, we did many, many years, for many years, still do them. So no difference really. And the idea is that this would open up the interior layer for me to sort of progress. Left nerve, left hypogastric nerve. And really, the clue for me is this round specimen. When I see the round specimen here, I know where I have to go. It's this air. The nerve has to drop away from me. So you are basically circumferentially growing around the tumor. 
anterior now, really just outside, and at this stage we would go across the Denovilius fascia, traction, counter-traction, and painting, just like open surgery. Nothing different really. Now I'm gonna go across the fascia here, Denovilius fascia, and then come right onto the pelvic tube. It only bleeds when I'm wrong. I often say that I don't come across many congenital abnormalities. I am often wrong, surg surgically speaking, because I go outside the plane. So you are right down now, all the way right, left before you staple it. And I'm just gonna sort of show you this, that how in a tight space you can get around here, get around on the left side, releasing it all the way back. Just gonna go across this now, Denovilius fascia here anteriorly, going across this, just like touching it and going across. So Jim, if you just move it forward for stapling perhaps, just there, yeah. Yeah, so same as um, today. For the stapling, the bit that perhaps you didn't appreciate and Jim did it, is that just before stapling, I change my robotic R1 to f for assistant port because I want the stapler to come below. Assistant is usually very high, so he has to come down to put the staple down. Otherwise, you would have a very oblique cut. So that's important as well. Two firing. Again, then the specimen will come back. Have a look at the, the TME specimen again. You know, look at the package to make sure this is complete. It should be without any defects. Complete package all the way down there. And, and I often say that it's not what you take out of the pelvis that is a marker of the quality of surgery. It is what you leave behind is the marker. And what you leave behind should be really two nerves, presacral fascia which is intact, and, and, a, and a pelvic floor which is clean and into the funnel. Again, very tight, going all the way in. So, so that's what I'm trying to say. Now this is an interesting case. This is a, a lady who had a complete response, had a radiotherapy, tumor disappeared, complete clinical response, and we decided to do wait and watch. And she had a tumor regrowth after one year. So this is uh, a TME done with a robot after one year of tumor regrowth. So, and she had a positive margin on the left side posterolaterally. Again, very similar as you would notice, cut across this. Two clips, maybe have one clip, the nerves are on the floor, flush on the aorta, medial to lateral dissection, gerota or fascia is coming towards me, and mesocolon is there, my assistant is pulling it down, and I'm just using it like a paint brush in my hand really, trying to separate the embryology from one another. Because if you notice the traction in my left hand, it is very gradual traction, it's not like big traction. So you mobilize it all the way, mobilize the colon, and I'm just gonna show you the TME now, I think. So again, progressing under the vein. It will come, it will come just now, I think. So at the moment, there's the TME. This is start of the TME, posterior package. Now you imagine this is radiotherapy after one year, so you might think it would be really horrible, but actually it was very pleasant in a way that you can see it's a very nice plane. So right nerve here. You stay inside the right nerve, painting it backwards. Just like this. It, it really is, if you notice the traction on the specimen, it is a graduated traction. It never is a big pull. I never pull the tissue in a big sort of way. I just use it like a graduated traction and I use the right hand as a paintbrush. And hopefully, if you are a bit lucky, it would just open up. So, go all the way down here between the nerves, open the side again, and do them in a small sort of steps, really. I don't look at the end game, I always look at the processes. So, I'm just gonna move it forward, Jim. I think we just move it slightly, because we're running out of time, and I'm mindful of the fact. You can see it's low now. Again, the same plane, same patient, staying inside the nerve. Move it slightly forward. This is the left side now. You can move it forward, I think. They've seen enough of it. Again, the left nerve. They look very, very similar actually, so there is no excitement. Um, so you can anterior now, okay Jim, move it all the way forward now I think. I'll just sort of give them the idea for the staple. If you just go all the way down, show the stapling bit. 
further it fit further so this is this is where the margin was sorry this is where the margin was positive okay that, anyway so never mind so i'll just sort of finish this off now uh, i'm just going to show you a couple of slides for robotic this is a um, an outcome with robotic and open tme procedure which obviously showed that outcomes are uh, similar slightly better in robotic arm better short term outcomes with length of stay uh, blood loss takes a bit longer as you would expect um, this is another paper looking at urogenital function, so nerve preservation um, in male patient and female patients. It shows that um, robotic TME had a better nerve preservation because you have a better view. This is comparison of lap with uh, or robotic with open data. Uh, it does reduce conversions and it does have advantage when people have um, a high conversion rate to use robot. So in conclusion, um, I would like to conclude and say that it's the concept of precision surgery that you should aspire to or look for rather than get really hung up with perhaps it is better with lap or better with robot or an open. So you need to learn TME as a cancer surgeon first before you start looking at different ways of doing it. Improvement in access and vision does make it easy. You know, laparoscopy have made it easy. In my view, robotics have made it even more easier. I genuinely think that we have to standardize each procedure we do. It's not about TME itself. It's anything we do, we need to have a standardized way of doing it. And Danilo will talk to you about the importance of standardization. Robot, I genuinely believe at present, is one of the tools that provide a better platform to do TME surgery. And how you get better, if any of you have heard uh, this rule, this rule of 10,000 hours, if you want to become world expert in anything, music, arts, TME surgery, do it for, practice it for 10,000 hours in your life and you will become there. But the problem is, it's not just the practice. This is a quote from an American football coach, uh, Vince Lombardi, who said that it is not just the practice that makes it perfect. It is the perfect practice that makes it perfect. I'm re really grateful to Alexei Karuchan and his team and for all of you to Stay two days and listen to me. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.